key iconic leaflet was that one that Radical Independence Campaign did, um, Britain's for the Rich, Scotland Can Be Ours. And we had, I think, 35 crucial bits of evidence on the back of that leaflet that Britain was not only failing the poor, but it was failing. Now, that leaflet, there's very, very little data about the campaign, but we know anecdotally that that leaflet was incredibly important. Important, and An enormous number of people used that as a primary means of trying to persuade people. Now, it didn't surprise me at all. It struck me as being absolutely straightforwardly obvious that the thing that you want to leave is something you must frame negatively. But I can't tell you how much resistance we got from parts of the Yes movement, um, and, and mainly official parts that seemed terribly nervous about it, that were really nervous about that leaflet. So despite being one of the most popular leaflets in the campaign, Yes Scotland for quite a while resisted putting it up on its website because they were doing the happy, happy, uh, happy clappy kumbaya thing relentlessly all the way through. Now, there's a number of reasons why this is a mistake. First of all, one of the big mistakes that was made in the last campaign was the, the way that we framed Britain as normality. So we, the, the, the early stages of the 2014 campaign involved the message that independent Scotland, you'll barely notice the difference. Continuity, everything will be fine, Queen Pound, all that kind of stuff. And that was, I mean, I understand how that came about. It was a mistake. It was a mistake in reading off polling where people were expressing anxiety and the belief that you can persuade them past their anxiety by pretending nothing's happening. That's just that. That wasn't going to work. But what it did is it psychologically says we are, us, the yes side, the independent supporting side, are actually saying that the safest version of your future is to be exactly like Britain. And what you're doing there is you're reinforcing in people's minds this idea that Britain's the safe option, that Britain is the that Britain is the model that we want to see as being um, the blueprint for our future. Now that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I, once again, I defy the I defy people to find serious political strategists anywhere in the world who would say you want somebody to vote against something. So frame your entire campaign as if the thing you want them to vote against is normality, is the preferable option, which is kind of what happened. Now, I was actually, I mean, way before the referendum really kicked off, I, this is a piece of private work, which was never really made public. This, I, I worked with the Scottish Independence Convention and a group of people with political, strategic and media expertise in Scotland to produce a, a paper kind of outlining the general campaign. And one of the things that we said in that is the more the campaign as a whole becomes nasty, negative in tone, uh, spiteful, horrible, blah, 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 the more that favours the no side. Whereas the more that the campaign becomes inspirational and positive and happy and all these kind of things, the more that favours the yes side. I mean, I absolutely hold to that. That's definitely right. I, I remember um, at one point in you know the early 2014 sitting watching some things that had been happening and thinking to myself, oh my God, is this is this our fault? Did we persuade people mistakenly that you could that being a positive tone of the campaign overall meant that you could never be negative? Um, because that's not right. It is perfectly possible to frame a negative as a positive. You, what you say is we can leave this failing Britain and have a better country. You could be critical while presenting it positively. And for reasons I don't fully understand, the, the Yes campaign wouldn't do that. I mean, you really struggled to get the kind of more senior official people on the telly, the, you know, the three or four people that were put up by Yes Scotland or SNP or whatever. You really struggled to get them to give you a reason what was wrong with Britain. And I found that difficult to understand. I don't think that happens this time. And I don't think that happens this time unfortunately, for bad reasons as well as good, which is you need to stretch your logic to claim that Britain's gone well just now, because it's kind of not. And by default, post-Brexit, everyone's been so critical of Britain that I can't see how we return back to the continuity version. Um, and it doesn't look like we're going to have sterling, the people are going to propose sterling union, and um, it certainly doesn't look like we're going to be 
facing the arguments, vote no for EU continuity. So there is no doubt in my mind, none whatsoever, that we've got to get over the fear of criticising Britain. And I think it was a fear. I think people were afraid that it would make them look petty or churlish or, or braveheartish. We've got to get over that. Um, and again, what my argument then, as my argument now, is that we've got to set a framework of normalcy, which isn't looking at England, Britain, but is looking at everywhere else in the world. What does a normal industrial relations system look like? Because Britain doesn't have one. What does a normal country's national grid operate like? Because Britain doesn't have that. And that's what we need to do more of next time. That's what Commonweal tried to do in the first referendum, was to say, look, here's a frame for what Scotland could be which is more than just what we know from Britain. And that, I think we need to do a lot more of that in the next campaign. Yeah, or uh, what's a normal rail system like? Or what's a normal pension system like? Because this is what the next thing I wanted to come on to. One of the things that we've seen in the analysis of the vote last time round is that basically the older age groups heavily, heavily voted no. And that was about protecting the pensions. But, you know, the Yes campaign were too slow to talk about how well, let's face it, it's one of the worst pensions in Europe. I mean, aside from just the pension issue, what do you think we can do in that kind of crucial age group to try and get more people to turn to yes? Because, I mean, it was really, really stark, the statistics last time. Well, I mean, I, I can't agree more on the pension thing. I was on, I did a radio debate, Radio Scotland um, debate on a Saturday morning not long before the referendum, and it was me and Willie Rennie. And Willie was sitting there with his, um, presumably with his cheat sheet of attacks on um, independence on the pensions issue. The subject was pensions. And during the during the this debate, I, I came back and just said, well, hold on a second here. You're defending what is widely regarded as the country with the, low, the, the fourth lowest state pension in Europe, the worst private pension in Europe, and the worst employer's pensions in Europe. And whoever was hosting the debate turned around to Willie Rennie and said, yeah, actually, Britain has got a very bad record in pensions. And he went quiet, like this question had never been posed to the No campaign before. I, I remember sitting at the time thinking, this is, this is a problem. If we've not managed to tell people that they're living in the country with the fourth lowest state pension in the European Union, despite being one of the richest countries in the European Union, and that if you're in employment, your pension is rubbish. And if you've got a private sector pension, you've been ripped off repeatedly over and over again. And everybody knows this with all the pension scandals. Why are we not talking about this? It made no sense to me. As to what we do next time, with everybody here, now I mean every group, the, the, the elderly, the, um, the young, the single mothers, women, I urge everyone to break things down a little further into the next level. So... An urban Labour voting pensioner is not going to be won over in the same way as a rural Blue Rins Tory pensioner. And this is one of the things which I've kind of been saying to almost anyone that I talk to. You need to go a bit a layer down below the, the big, big top level if you want to work out how to get people. Because the old, everyone over 55 is far too broad a, a category to get to everybody. So absolutely, without doubt, definitely, we need to nail down the pensions issue this time. We are doing some work on it just now um, to try and say, here's a model which ensures a really secure state pension and is, and is something simple and understandable that we can sell. But you see, I don't think that does it in itself because... If you break down, and I've done it a little bit in my head, if you break down the different kind of pensioner groups, there are some of them we're not going to win flat out. So like I say, rural Blue Rins Tory vote isn't going to come over to yes. And there's another group of post-war Scots. I was staying at a bed and breakfast in Inverness. And the guy who had the bed and breakfast was very polite, but clearly wasn't a yes voter. And you know he was comparatively working class, but he'd been a, he'd been Navy and he'd been stationed in England for 20 years. We're not going to get him over just by fixing the pension problem. So what I would argue is that the group of pensioners we are most likely to be able to bring round are urban, both town and city, the urban state pension-reliant pensioner. 
And the message has got to be about a, a better, more secure society for them, and in for particular for their children and their grandchildren. In my opinion, if we want to target those ones that we can bring over, we have to start thinking about the legacy that we want them to leave for their grandchildren, for the Scotland that we want to build. And one of the initiatives, for example, in the last referendum, which was great, but was absolutely half-heartedly done, and was for show and not for real, was the late on, and this is not Generation Yes's fault, um, it, I, I won't go into the politics of it, but there was, um, there was mucking about with this, that idea of getting the yes supporting grandchild to go and talk personally to their no supporting grand and grandpa about their hopes for the future and about what they want for themselves, that's the kind of thing which can change the attitudes of older groups. But we're not getting them all. So break it down beyond below that that level, that question of they're over 55, start breaking them down into another series of categories, another series of groups below that, and look at them individually. Think about them individually and conclude which ones you're going to prioritise, what do they care about, which ones you're going to write off um, as unlikely to be got, and what does that tell you? We need to do that. In fact, I'll be honest, I'd encourage anybody to go and spend some time just doing that. Take every category, so... Um, geography, age, gender, married or not married, homeowner, not homeowner, urban, rural, whatever it is, take all these categories. So think about single mother in a small town in the north of Scotland. So that category of person, what's their concerns? If they voted or didn't vote, why? What would work for them? And then think about um, a single mother in, in a city in the central belt. If they didn't vote, why? What would have done it for them? And then think about a recently divorced middle-class mother who's now a single mother with a professional background in a city. What's their thing? So the more that you take it down to categories where you can almost identify a person and the more that you think about that person, think about them as people and not as some sort of odd demographic category, it helps you to for yourself to think through what you think would or wouldn't work for each of these groups. And it's a it's so much it's a much, much richer way of trying to work out what we can do than lumping people into big ginormous categories which, which constitute, you know, 30, 40 percent of the population. One of the things which has my teeth grinding every time I hear it is when people say, oh, next time around we have to win over the middle classes. Now if we're seeing things like that I'm afraid we're still amateur hour because the middle classes is a group of people so big, so massive, so diverse, so spread out that it doesn't have much continuity within itself. So somebody who's in a white collar job, but it's low income with with low levels of job security is middle class. They probably own a, you know, a wee, a wee house, a wee bungalow somewhere, but they're struggling and yet uh, a well-paid new town of Edinburgh banker who's probably got five, six times that salary. They, those two categories of people have nothing in common. And to, just to throw them into a basket saying middle class and what the middle class like is bankers. And can I just say I'm, I'm fucking bamboozled by this idea that the middle classes all love bankers and therefore attracting lots of bankers to Scotland will cheer up the middle classes. <laughs> <clears throat> that's, that's not my experience of the middle classes I know. A lot of them are rather annoyed at their banks and um, aren't exactly over the moon at the bailouts. So I did this with a group. I was up in Fort William and we sat over lunch. They invited me to chat to them. And I just said, right, try that. Have a think about some of the groups. And a number of people said to me, oh, it looks totally different when you think about it that way. And I was saying, yes, that's exactly right. People do not vote as blocks of 20 or 30 percent of the population. They vote as individuals and you have to think of them much more as individuals. And the conclusion, I mean, I've said this many times, the conclusion, I've done this for myself in my own head quite a lot over the last couple of years. And my own conclusions to this is that if you look at who is likely to be the next group, the next 10% of the Scottish population who are going to change position and give us a strong yes majority, actually, they look very like the people who already voted yes. One of the, one of the mistakes that I think the independence movement is making is that there's a category of people who are yes, 
And then there's another separate distinct species, which are called no. And we've got to send out some kind of anthropological ex uh, expedition to poke and prod and examine these strange alien no people to work out what it is that 